Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving an exponential equation with the imaginary unit i. So we have i to the power x equals 1, and we're going to be finding the x values that satisfies this equation. So, when you have a real number at the base, like 2 to the power x equals 1, and if you're looking for real solutions, then you can immediately say, hey, x must be 0, because 2 to the power 0 equals 1. This is true for all real bases where the base is different from 0. The only exception would be 0 to the power 0, which is problematic. But other than that, you can safely say that x will be 0 in these cases. So, But we have a complex or imaginary base, so things are a little different. And we're going to be looking for all solutions. All right, so obviously 0 is a solution to this equation because if you replace x with 0, that satisfies the equation. Even though the base is i, it still works. But let's go ahead and find general solutions. By writing the base as a complex number in polar form. So here's what we're going to do. Suppose z equals i. z represents a complex number here. And i can be written as 0 plus 1i. So we have a real part and an imaginary part for our complex number. In general, they're written as a plus bi. And on the complex plane, we can basically graph them as a point or I guess you can call it a vector. Okay? So let's go ahead and do that. We have the real axis here and the imaginary axis here. And our number is basically represented by the point 0, 1. Okay? as well as a plus b i is represented by a comma b. Make sense? Okay, great. So let's go ahead and plot that point. 0 comma 1 is basically no real part and all imaginary, or you can call it pure imaginary, right, I guess. So let's go ahead and mark it here on the imaginary axis. That is going to be our number one unit away from the origin. So let's go ahead and connect that. And that's going to give us the r value, which is the same thing as absolute value of z, which is 1 in this case, because our number is basically 0, 1. Okay? So r is 1, which is the absolute value, and we do need the angle. So what is the angle? So let's go ahead and move this stuff a little bit up so that we can write our angle here. So r is the modulus or you can I guess call it the absolute value so the angle here is going to be pi over 2 because we're looking basically at the angle that our number makes with the positive x-axis so if you have no r and theta this is going to be r theta in this case then you can basically write our number as r times e to the power i theta in this case, theta would be pi over 2 and r is 1. So our number 1, I mean i, not 1, just 1i or i, can be written as 1 times e to the power i times pi over 2. Make sense? Okay. So how does this help? And obviously, we can write this as e to the power i times pi over 2 without the 1 in the front. So this is our number in polar form. But we also have to worry about the right-hand side because we're kind of equating or setting something with the base of e. So e to the power of something equals 1. Then the exponent is 0. No. We have to change the base of the right-hand side. So that means we also need to write 1 as a complex number. But 1 is, and by the way, this is equivalent to cosine pi over 2 plus i sine pi over 2. You can also write it that way. And 1 can be written as cosine of 2 pi plus i times sine of 2 pi. 2 pi kind of represents 0, but at the same time, it's 2 pi or multiples of 2 pi. So if you go ahead and write it as e to the power i times 2 pi, that's going to be a more compact form. Make sense? Okay. But in general, in general, we have uh, something nicer because this is kind of like one of the branches, a kind of a specific branch, you can call, <coughs> excuse me, you can call that a principal branch if you want. But in general, in general, one can be written as e to the power i times 
2 and pi. In other words, you can basically replace 0 radians or 0 degrees with multiples of 2 pi because that will be the same thing after all these rotations, right? Cool. Now, let's go ahead and write our equation. We have something for i, and remember our original equation was i to the power x equals 1. Now I'm going to go ahead and replace i with this and 1 with that. But not with this, actually. I should probably say the more general form, not this one, but this one. And it doesn't matter on the left-hand side if you use the principal branch or the... Well, actually, we should use this one because it is ra being raised to the power x anyways, so the x will take care of all the different branches. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the placements. I will be replaced with e to the power i times pi over 2. And then, of course, you have to raise it to the power x. And 1 will be replaced with e to the power i times 2n pi. 2n pi repre represents multiples of 2 pi. Make sense? Cool. Now, let's go ahead and see if, if we can find the x value from here. That, actually, that would be fairly easy to do, but let's go through the process real quick. So we can write this as e to the power i x times pi over 2. I just put the x together with the i. It doesn't matter. You can write it any way you want. And that is equal to e to the power i times 2 and pi. Now, since the bases are equal, we could actually natural log both sides, right? Or you can just say, hey, if the bases are equal, then the exponents are equal, so on and so forth. Same thing. And we get the following. i x times pi over 2 equals i times 2 and pi. By the way, writing this way is not the only way to do it. You could also write it as i times x times pi over 2 or just i x pi over 2. Uh, this doesn't look very well, but, you know, uh, it's still understood most of the time. And hopefully, I hope uh, x doesn't look like a multiplication symbol, which we usually use a raised dot for. Anyway, so this is our equation in the most simplest form. Let's go ahead and simplify this. And we're going to look at an alternative approach to this problem or maybe a, an explanation of what is going on. So I cancels out, pi cancels out, leaving us with a 1 here. So I get x over 2 equals 2n. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention what n is. n is an integer, okay? Element of z. So from here we get x equals 4n, where n is an integer. In other words, if our x is a multiple of 4, then we get a solution. Why does this make sense? Let's go ahead and take a look at it. And by the way, if n is equal to 0, then x will be 0, and i to the power 0 will be 1, so it'll be satisfied for the specific case. But this is a more general solution, okay? n is an integer. So let's go ahead and take a look at why this is working. And you, for this, you need to consider powers of i. Remember, i is the number whose square equals negative 1 by definition. So i to the power 1 is itself. i to the second power is negative 1 by definition. i to the third power is i squared times i, but i squared is negative 1, so this is a negative i. And, tada, i to the fourth power is i cubed times i, or negative i times i, or negative i squared. And i squared is negative 1, so this is going to be positive 1. You can also look at i to the fourth as i squared squared, which is negative 1 squared, and that is equal to positive 1. There's a unique value for this, but when you say i to the power x equals 1, that's a different story. Now, what do we do with this? If i to the fourth is 1, then you can just raise both sides to the power n, and we'll still have a valid equation, and i to the 4n will be 1, and that means x will be 4n as before. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.